Welcome to everyone. I'm David Fay. I'm Professor of British Studies at the University of Sorbonne Nouvelle in Paris. And along with my colleague Charlotte Gould, I'd like to introduce this special issue of ANG devoted to urban experiments in the UK from the 19th century to the 21st century. Cities have long been a fertile ground for experiment. This has to do with Britain being uh, the first country in the world to become a predominantly urban society. Uh, and this through industrialization. So whether in 2022 or in the Victorian age, they have proved to be laboratories, hothouses. In the 19th century, urban pioneers tried to put their visions to the test. Their legacy can still be found in the model urban settlements of Bourneville, Port Sunlight or Saltaire, for instance. This spirit underlies other philanthropic schemes to redesign the late Victorian city, such as covered markets. The 20th century was initially dominated by garden cities and the new town's experiment. However, from the 1960s onwards, the focus of the authorities shifted to the living conditions of city dwellers, opening the way to countless experiments at the local level. The Thatcher years were not particularly favourable to political and economic decentralisation. However, paradoxically, they fueled numerous experiments in labour. In places where new tensions and opportunities have emerged, while it opposed the activist political art supported by Ken Livingston in London, the Thatcher government was also finding inspiration in the American model of culture-led urban regeneration, supporting artistic and cultural initiatives in derelict neighbourhoods. At the turn of the century, the new labour years were characterised by a renewed optimism about UK cities and the conviction that they held the key to a number of contemporary issues. Both the production and consumption of culture were seen as a catalyst for city regeneration. Since 2010, British governments have joined forces in defence of localism, namely experimenting with local scale solutions to local issues. This new agenda has given rise to the Bristol Pound, smart neighbourhoods in Glasgow, Manchester, Hull, etc. Or initiatives to improve the sustainability of the urban environment. All this before Covid became synonymous with new threats on the high street. More generally, since the 1960s, UK cities have witnessed and experienced the birth of a multicultural society and they have sought to address the challenge. At a literary level, visions for improved cities, but also dystopian ones, have formed the backdrop of many fictional narratives and some experimental novels and films. This armed journal issue revolves around cities in the British Isles from the 19th century to the 21st century, and more particularly on urban experiments and societal change in the British Isles in general. It therefore focuses on both the hard and soft urban projects that have been devised and implemented since the late 19th century as a means of transforming towns and cities and addressing local issues. It features 11 articles. In the pre-Raphaelite city and the trap of modernity shows what an ambivalent seductress the city is, a belle dame sans merci whose deceptive oppression stems from the untamed progress and dehumanizing and alienating excesses which foster the twin oppressions of capitalism and misogyny, compounded by a new microclimate actually generated by the new British industrialization and urbanization. Still, for the pre-Raphaelite poets, the built environment is a continuation of both nature and culture, which, Rigel reflects, is not entirely rejected. Three of our articles focus on Manchester. In development and regeneration in Ancourts, Manchester from industrial suburb to urban village, Aurore Kenyet explores the mutation of a famous 19th century quarter in Manchester, born out of the industry-led development of a city, and which was to become an urban village two centuries later. The Young Coates Urban Village Company has developed a different urban design approach, thereby carrying out an urban regeneration experiment of its own. In underground Manchester, as Urban Palimpsest, 
Clive Robel describes Janet Winterson's 2019 novel, Frankenstein, A Love Story, as urban fiction. Defining urban fiction is not straightforward, with Jens Martin Gurr in fact remarking that in a world as urbanized as ours, any novel attempting remotely to capture contemporary experience is bound to be in some sense an urban novel. Janet Winterson's Frankenstein does engage with urban complexity by setting Mary Shelley's myth against the backdrop of Manchester. And Robel examines how the uh, labyrinthine novel's reflection on humanity and its boundaries, in fact, also questions the monstrous contemporary city. In Manchester's health deal, is devolution truly beneficial for the region? Louise Dellingwater looks at a unique urban experiment when Greater Manchester was chosen to be the first urban region to run its own health and social care budget. She reviews the negative and positive assessments of devolution and raises the question of funding to implement such changes. In Urban Innovation and Philanthropy, New Perspectives on the Columbia Market in London, Emily Noussar reconsiders Columbia Market as an example of the urban character of neighborhood covered markets, focusing on its implementation and insertion within a larger project to respond to the hygienist principles of the time and the transportation problems specific to the victim. Another figure experimenting with town planning, besides the philanthropist, has been the landowner. With the large landowner as a visionary planner, Stéphane Sadou aims at filling a gap in the literature by focusing on the often overlooked role large landowners can play in planning processes. Sadou focuses on initiatives led by Lord Salisbury in Hertfordshire, a county which is home to a number of world-famous planned communities and which therefore holds a special place in the history of British planning. In an essay in Civilization, Stevenage and the post-war New Towns programme, Steve Wall critically examines the experience of Stevenage, the first new town to be designated, in light of changing political, economic and social circumstances at local and national levels. He charts its development and points to a number of limitations. In an urban experiment in small town sustainability, the case of Cityslow, Suzanne Ball explains what the new Cityslow label entails and how, in a context of austerity, 10 British towns have adopted the ideas for action that it promotes. Cityslow's charter aims at developing support in the community through a series of technical measures. While the Cityslow model has not been adopted by UK planning in terms of legislation and guidance to regulate land use in the public interest, the 54 policy goals of its charter have provided useful guidelines for sustainable development. Another recent experiment is that of the Smart City. In the rebranding of Newcastle as Smart City, Emmanuel Avril aims to contribute to the discussion on smart cities by confronting official discourses with practices through the case of the mid-sized city of Newcastle. She explores the uses of smart city tools and discourse to rebrand the city of Newcastle in the northeast of England. In the end of history in Kevin Barry's City of Bohain, Sylvie Winkowski describes how in Irish author Barry's first novel, City of Bohain, nothing is real and yet everything rings true. Both a dystopia and a satire in which post-financial crisis Ireland is easily recognisable. The novel describes a city where time is out of joint and entropy has been substituted for progress. The book can therefore be read as a satire of contemporary Ireland and more specifically as an exploration of Irish cities' twisted relation to modernity. Finally, in Migrants in the City, Rethinking the Governance of Integration in an Age of Superdiversity, Donia Twiri Mbarek focuses on the concept of superdiversity, which has resulted from mass immigration and has created many challenges for local authorities. She contrasts the dominant discourse which requests local authorities to take the lead in the integration issue with the constraints set by national governments on local government. 